that was a definite bump my first time with that. And it was like, I like this acting thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we had that McDonald's coming to us here. Um, but what, what that did though, I mean, what, that was a big movement as you saw in the beginning of this reel. Um, it was, you know, it, uh, it took, it took a, someone who understands body language to have played that character too. Because you know, you have puppeteers that are running in the face off camera going with joysticks and pulleys and levers that were operating the mouth um, and the eyebrow movement on that big moon head face. But I was also a puppeteer of sorts to get his, his, his head and, and, and the, from the neck down, all of that animation. So, uh, so that was, uh, that was um, uh, my first foray into really, you know, creating a character with lots of stuff on me. And, and over, over those three years, we would do a commercial shoot for a couple of days and then go dormant for a month or two and shoot a couple more commercials. So the Creature Effects makeup guy that, that, that um, created the Moonhead, um, he ran that shop out of his garage. So he was not a big up and running Creature Effects shop. So he borrowed people from other Creature shops when we had a, we had a big job to do. So every time we got a commercial shoot up and running every few months, uh, he would borrow people from Stan Winston Studios and Rick Makers and uh, Greg Cannon's shops. And, and so I got to know people in the creature effects business really quickly by all these borrowed people that would come from bigger shops and work on the Mad Night campaign for like a couple of days. And they would go back to their shop and, um, uh, and then remember me, which was very sweet. So that's how the referral process got started. Um, I, uh, so anytime that they would, you know, if someone at Stan Winston's or Rick Makers or, or shop would be like, a, oh, we have this movie with a tall, skinny alien in it, and oh, no, uh, I just worked with that, uh, this guy named Doug Jones in a movie head, it would be perfect for that. That's how the referral thing got started. So my phone started ringing with um, offers coming in, like, uh, you know, producers um, of movies and TV shows like that with a creature, and they don't often know what to do with that creature, so they, they really defer all that stuff to the creature makers. If they, if they have an actor that, that they think is right for that, the producer usually says, great, great, uh, just get him in here and we'll, we'll sign the papers. That was fine. So, uh, so, uh, so I, I, did, I kind of rose in my career through the back door <laughs> and through uh, the creature effects uh, alleyway, you know, as opposed to through the casting office in the front. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was watching the, the Hellboy 2 sequence on the scissor board. And yeah. you have that sequence there where you're doing all of those arching the back thing, and doing flipping stuff, and rolling around. Oh, and you're fighting right. Oh, right. That, I, that stunt doubles are golden, right? Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, that was a sequence getting away from, from Mr. Wink, um, who was a, uh, a Brazilian capoeira artist who came from Brazil. They had bought into our uh, shoot in Hungary at the time uh, to do that one sequence for me. Yeah, because I wouldn't know how to do that. Yeah. I, I was looking at that night thinking, you don't want me in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel pretty agile, but you're exactly how I do it. Yeah. So, I balance the feet with some days. So you know, obviously have to do a lot of uh, kind of workout or yoga stuff to be in those yeah. costumes and everything. To, uh, yeah, but, uh, right. Uh, as far as being in shape for what roles I play, yeah. um, well, I'm 58 years old now, so it's getting harder and harder all the time. But uh, I, I, tend to, I, I tend to work out and have, a, have my exercise routine is, is based in fear. <laughs> when I get a job that I feel is above my skill level, I'm terrified and I go, go to the gym. <laughs> so that's, that's how I get in shape in my role. It's like, I can't do this! <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I'm done ready for it. Uh, the Shape of Water was one that I was really scared of because I also had to take that, that beautiful rubber, rubber suit and makeup uh, into the water. And that, that had me really scared of like, am I gonna hold up? This is where I die. You know, this is where I die. I, I didn't know. Well, uh, I know a lot of actors say their experience in the water. Is, what's that? Uh, a lot of actors say their experience in the water is um, uh, more than expected. Like the water's cold sometimes, or in there longer than you expect, or oh, yeah. was that your experience? You're going to be in there longer than you thought, yeah. Um, but uh, in the shape of water, uh, the, most, the most water interaction I had was in the, uh, in the pool that was in the, the laboratory. I spent a lot of time in that. Uh, either diving into it, coming up out of it, sitting in it, eating eggs from it, <laughs> listening to music, and having lunch break with, with little uh, Sally Hawkins. Um, so I was in there for hours on hours, getting a lot of water, you know, and, and the, uh, the latex foam rubber with some silicone bits on it too, but the, the 
from latex was like, it, it was a sponge. So uh, it was buoyant in the water, and, but coming out of the water, I was another 100 pounds. It was so heavy. You were what, going to our time? I'm sorry? You were wet? I was not the entire time. No, if you saw me out of the water in the, at the apartment scenes, or uh, you know, in, in the back of a car, or something, um, I was not waterlogged. Uh, they would spritz me down though for every scene, so that I had a lot of water, a wet sheen to. Oops, that was me. Oh, did I wet? Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I was spritzed down, and then also uh, maybe like a little bit of KY jelly to just to uh, get, get a glisten that would stay on me, but it wouldn't dry too fast. Uh, while we were filming, uh, that's a little trick they do, and they'll spritz that with water to keep it to keep it wet looking. We do that with Dave Sapien too. On the other movies, I do wet looking all the time. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, Hollywood do a better job at uh, making sure the water is not stagnant by just a cesspool. Oh. <laughs> Right, well, uh, that pool in the, I think that's about temperature, yeah, the, the pool in the, in the lab that I was talking about was, was warmed up. It was, uh, it was like swimming in the tropics. It was lovely. Uh, so that's why I could be involved. It was too, it was just too chilly, and I didn't probably even, I could, it would have gone right through my bones, and I, I, would, I would have shivered and become a mess that I couldn't have performed. So, uh, yeah, they, they warmed the water for us. And the, uh, the, in the shape of water, also the, the bathroom scene, where she stuffs the towels under the door and then puts on all the, the faucets and we start flooding the, the room. Uh, that was the bathroom set was then rebuilt in a tank, an eight foot tank, so they could actually pull that water gag off. Uh, so that doesn't actually work in your bathroom. <laughs> it doesn't. I, I wouldn't try it at home. No. Please don't do yeah, yeah. I doubt you'll get much. Yeah. You'll flood the floor and it'll annoy the neighbors. Something. Right. Yeah. Um, right. But uh, but that water was also warmed up. Uh, it, was, it was a huge tank, so it, that took, it was quite a process, yeah. It's not cheap to film a watery movie, it's not. Nice. Yeah. So, um, so you must then obviously have uh, a lot of makeup artists that, that you get to know pretty well in the process of putting all of that stuff on for hours and hours. I imagine that they probably uh, really appreciate how you portray those characters as they come into work with them. Well, that's, that's a part of that referral process, too. You know, a makeup artist who's been spent hours and hours a day with me for months at a time on a movie shoot, uh, their referral is, is that's why why producers listen to them, because someone has worked with me uh, intimately like that for a long time. And you do get to know your makeup artist really, really well. That's the person you know best on set because you're with them for, you know, well, on the Hellboy 1, you were doing a seven hour makeup a day, uh, per day, uh, as they were saying. Seven hours a day, yeah, uh, to get ready for work. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So I was with them longer than anybody else, and then they're we're, they're not done. But once the makeup is ready, ready to be filmed, they have to chase you around all day and keep fixing things that are coming unglued, or they, you know, they have smeared, or they, anything. It, it's a, it's an all day event. And then the makeup removal process. Your makeup artist is not done when they get it on you. They got to take it off you at the end of the day too. And that was a two hour makeup removal. So, uh, so we did, we got to know each other really, really well. Yeah. Every crevice of me. <laughs> <laughs> any any horror stories that you can tell about makeup processes? Oh, Nothing yeah. where you can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, yeah. I, are there any makeup artists helpful in here ever? Yeah, sometimes it often is. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, every day is a horror story uh, because you're just maybe going through uh, things that human beings shouldn't go through. <laughs> so yeah, I'm exposed to um, toxic fumes and and uh, you know airtight situations that your skin is built, doesn't thrive in and that kind of thing. Um, but I, you know, I have many friends who have you know, gotten infections from bacteria by, by working in, in you know, doing swamp uh, um, monsters that are in some kind of encased in rubber and they're, they're crawling around the, in the ground in the, the Louisiana bayou somewhere and then they, they get some skin infection that they have to go to the hospital for or whatever that's happened. Uh, with me, it's been more, uh, more cuts and bruises, yeah. Um, I, well, I, I had uh, so, uh, 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 a little thing of uh, physics, just simple physics. There was a, a sleeve that went on, came all the way up to here, and there was going to be a, a costume piece that came down to a short sleeve costume. So there was a creature arm from here down. I won't tell you the movie or TV show, so I don't want to put anybody in trouble. But, <laughs> but uh, the, getting this sleeve on, uh, the makeup artist.
was kind of tugged it up and then glued a rim around my arm here to hold it up, right? Right? And then, uh, uh, and then uh, it looked fine, it worked fine, but what they didn't take into account is that all the pressure, the downward pressure of that sleeve is now being held by this one little ring of glue. Well, that, that loosened and tore my skin. Uh, and we, so when they were trying to remove it at the end of the day, my skin came with it. I uh, really loosened up and blistered to the point where it's like turning blue and the skin was stuck to the piece. And uh, so we learned to do a stripe of blue this way and this way so that, they, so that the pressure would be um, graduated through the entire piece instead of just around the ring. It's a simple physics, but we, we, learned, we learned things like that the hard way. Well, I'm sure you may have a Yeah, no, no, there was no of course. Um, so a question that I have, because you know, I kind of like your work to um, the, the traditional work from Ron Chaney and, and those guys. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, no, very impressive. But, um, the competition from CGI yeah. and CGI characters, what's that like right now? No, oh, uh, better now than it was. When CGI was first, the advent of CGI, I mean, it was getting better and good enough to, to do character replacement, where you, would, you don't need someone on set who's like, do a tennis ball and everybody goes, ah, and you draw it in later. Uh, when that started happening uh, with, with, with better results, um, everybody in the creature effects makeup industry started you know, shaking, going, ah, and the, the creature, the, the practical effects houses did have a slump for a minute there because everybody thought, I can see you later. Well, the expense and the look are, are what kind of came to, you know, the audience, and you guys, thank you for, for barking up like you do. It's like, you, you weren't always buying that CG character, right? You might not have the heart and soul that, 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 that an actor in makeup would have had. Especially in the eyes, you know, that's, that's hard. And, and, and a big, big lumbering creature to get the weight of it, uh, that often doesn't, doesn't play as well with CG. So it just all depends. Now, um, I have lots of CG artist friends, so I don't want to ever poo-poo their work either. I think, I think, and they're getting better all the time, that's getting, uh, you know, with the performance capture capabilities now, like with, when you have Andy Circus who does a Gollum character, well, that's one where you can connect with him, you can get a full performance out of him. And when he played, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the main ape in uh, Planet of the Apes or King Kong, uh, you know, he's just done, and, and, and the, the Peter Jackson uh, company, Wet Up Workshop, they just do such really good work. So it can be done right and well, but for me personally, I like, I, I'm an old school person, I like, I like the practical effects. I, know for, I think people like to watch other people, you know, and and, uh, and we like to watch other people's performances, even if we you know, even if they're covered like this, you still know there's a person that you can appreciate the performance that made that happen. So, um, so but I, I think the blend of both mediums, CG and practical effects together is where we're at now, with, uh, with really great results, and I've done a, a lot of characters like that. Um, the Silver Surface, you saw clips out there, it looks very CG-ish. Um, that would actually start with me in a whole rubber makeup costume that I was the silver surfer every day. And then they did a CG enhancement over me in post-production uh, so that, so that he, he, he moved and, and, and seemed more authentic. Now part of that movie too, uh, I powered down and lost my silver coating, if you remember that, and it was kind of tarnished and withered. Uh, during that time, uh, that was just me in the suit and makeup, the, the, the CG enhancement that was, was, uh, was absent for those sequences. So if you want to, if you review that movie, you can see what that's what I really look like in the, in the rubber bits. Um, and uh, uh, for Dave Sapien in, uh, in the Hellboy movies, my eyes were kind of up. There were big fish eyes that were out here, and they were just kind of stagnant in the mask. So in post production, they made them blink, they made them look around, they made them express a little bit more. Uh, that was a great marriage of, of practical and visual effects together. Also, in the shape of water as well. Um, also, the shape of water was another combo platter. Uh, the, the eyes and, and, and brows of that uh, uh, face were stagnant as well. And I could, it was thick enough that I couldn't move it and manipulate it myself from inside the mask. So, uh, in post production, they can animate a little bit. And, and uh, keeping it subtle is key. And I think they did a great job of making that, that fish man look like he was living and breathing and real. So, so uh, the answer is all that. I mean, the, the combo platter is what works best, you know, I think. And yes, love. I already answered for you. So, you know, you've had this wonderful long career, right? And you've met all kinds of other celebrities. Can you talk about the process? 
process of first coming into your career and being starstruck, and now getting on the other side where people are starstruck when they meet you. That's what they don't get. I have a crowd of people here who are starstruck. Oh, okay. yeah, that's right. yeah. The purple one. Yeah. <laughs> You have a lot of words. I'm a little bit of a fan girl here. So. No, that's very really sweet. Thank you. Okay. You know, that, that boggles my mind. Uh, yeah, you know, because I, you know, I, uh, my first big movie that I had a credit in was Batman Returns, and so here I am face to face with Michael Keaton and Danny DeVito and Christopher Walken and uh, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer was in that as well. So, you know, those are some big names when you're a young actor starting out from, oh my God, where am I? Um, and, uh, Going to focus, focus. Uh, I'd already been a big fan of Beth Midler's for many years before this. Uh, you know, she was a, a recording artist and a comedian and a, and a film star. And she just done a whole lot of Disney Touchstone pictures, including you know, Down on Beverly Hills, uh, Outrageous Fortune, um, oh God, the list goes on and on. Um, and uh, so the beaches had been done by then. Uh, so to focus, focus. You know, being this far from her face, my first night of work on focus, focus. I was just like. Oh, Tank girl. Tank girl, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't know who, who in their career can say I was a, I was a kangaroo man mutant twice, and I was a fish man in mutants twice. So I don't know say that besides me. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. I guess that comes back. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was wondering if you had uh, anything to say about Desi Man's makeup, and just that, like, I don't know, they work so hard. They do work so hard. Oh yeah, and, uh, phenomenal work for, for the amount of time they're not given. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Face Off is a... Well, Face Off, uh, what I like about the show, what I hate about the show, is, is that uh, uh, it kind of sensationalized that, that end of the business and made it seem like it was really easy. Like you can, just, you can pop up a character like that in three days. 
they had a lot of behind the scenes help that you didn't see on TV. Uh, that, that we would work 24 you know, round the clock while they were sleeping <laughs> to come back on the next day. Like the mold makers and that kind of thing, uh, you didn't see that being, being cooked and done. Uh, and creating a feature takes a long time. So, but, so the amount of artistry that went into the day to design and execute and apply those makeups within three days, that was incredible work, I think. And uh, so, so it felt bad having to judge it, though, because I just wanted to encourage everybody, because they all did such great work, and you had to send somebody home. And you, had, you had to send a really good piece home, which, which didn't feel good. Yeah, so uh, competition shows, that's the part I don't like, is the competition part. I just like to see makeups, you know, <laughs> that, that'd be fine. But, uh, but, but it was fun to be on the show. I know everybody on the show it was. Um, Glenn Hetrick did my makeup in, uh, and created my, my long arms and legs uh, in uh, Legion when I was an ice cream man, a creepy guy. Uh, and B. Neal created my, my clown makeup look for uh, Batman Returns. And, uh, and Neville Page created my look for uh, Commander Saru in Star Trek Discovery. So everybody on the judging panel had worked with me. Uh, and, um, and McKinsey Westmore, of course, part of the Westmore legacy clan of, of makeup people. Uh, I know her whole family, so she's, so I would, it was like coming home every time, like, hi guys, I'm here! <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great fun. Uh, yeah, yes, so you got to say. Um, how much rehearsal time do you have? Are you in costume when you're rehearsing, or do you have out of costume rehearsal time? That's a great, a great question, um, because uh, the luxury of rehearsal is not afforded you in every movie you do. Uh, it's not part of the budget often. Um, so I, I do have my own personal time. My, my, my personal process is, when I'm given a script, uh, or you know, when I'm given a project to do, the script is my first place to start. I have to, I want to read it and find out what's the story, what am I part, what's my part of the story, um, what, 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 is the, what is the narrative, what is the writer's description of that character uh, or creature, uh, so I can get it in here, right? <clears throat> what's my interaction with other characters within the story, and how do I push them along, or how do they push me along? I want to find all that out from the script. And then I can go to the director and have a meeting with the director. He or she will tell me what their quirks and, and nuances are that they want to see out of this character and out of this story, and they'll give me a vision of their storytelling. That's great. That's great information to log in as well. And then I go to a dance studio, often when my, my 24 hour fitness has in the road through at 2 in the morning and no one's in there, so I go in there. Uh, mirrors, wooden floor, and I can just like be, okay, now what? Oh. Uh, where do we start with this? Uh, okay, so is it a, is it a, is it a this? Is it a this? Is it a, is it a, is it a this? Is it a this? Is it a, a this? Is it a, there's so many different, different play, ways you can play with your, with that character's home posture. What, what, what is his or her home stance and posture? And then what movement and what, what is required to be from that script? And do I have to crawl the wall? Do I have to lunge after the little children? Do I have to, uh, you know, do I have to sit wine like a refined gentleman? All, I want all that to be a part of, 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 of the physicality that I can come up with. So if it looks, and that's just me in the mirror with, you know, shorts and a t-shirt on. Then I have to, then, then the, the real process starts when the makeup people start, uh, my fittings and my test makeups. Uh, so there, there start, we see a creature design, um, uh, the concept art often tells me a lot too. If I can see how big or lumpy it is, or the, if there's really long arms, like, oh, that's going to be arm extensions involved, or if it's up on, on hoof feet, and then, oh, there's either stilts or some kind of weird boot to wear, like Surrey for Discovery. Um, so, finger extensions, that kind of thing. Um, and then when they start making those pieces and applying them to me, and then I start, uh, you know, then I can, then I can and, and we do t months worth of, of pre-testing and pre-fittings when you have a big budget movie, especially a TV show. Uh, so that, that informs the rest of it. Um, you know, if I have, like, in Pan's Lab, if my, if my ramp horns came out to here, you know, and so it tilted the head and became very dramatic. My finger extensions became very dramatic when I, when I gestured um, because they were so much longer. <laughs> so, physics uh, changes. I'm sorry? The physics change. The physics change, right. So, and, no, so, and a creature can enhance uh, it, 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 these pieces can enhance your movement or they can hinder it, right? If I, if I rehearse something up here, like, and, uh, and then I go to the creature shop and I'm stuck here instead, well, then I have to change the ecosystem that I came up with, right? Um, just, I just want to, I want to make it natural. So by the, by the time I make it to Canada, then, um, I've had time in the creature shop, you know, running around on their floor. I, um, and then also ingesting the material, especially if there's dialogue involved. 
a lot of readers do have verbal dialogue as well, and so I want to make sure that that has the right sound and cadence that fits the look and fits the, the personage of that monster, right? So there's a, a lot goes into it. A lot goes into it. So by the time I, the film rolls, I want that creature to look up like I to look like I just woke up that way that day instead of a guy in a suit. Yeah, that's that's my my my, my challenge. Yeah. I've so never you seen friends. you look like a guy in a suit. So what's that? I've never seen you look like a guy in a suit. Oh bless you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. So I think it's working. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. Yes. I think that uh, you know, creatures that are like that are like this because of all the physics involved and all the makeup processing and whatnot. Do you, do you think that too? Well, uh, well uh, first of all, I would never, especially with cameras going, I would never <laughs> say <laughs>
like sort of a budgish face and a and a creepy like overcoat that looked like wings almost. It was so it was a it was a bug mimicking a man. Hence the name of the movie. Yes. Uh, so and I just I just had to stand at the edge of a three-story brick building uh, with a rain machine hitting me in the face. And, right, because Del Toro's movies are all full of rain. If you notice this, right? There's a rain scene in every. Yeah. So, um, so here we are on the top of this building, and all uh, at the edge of it. And I just had to lean over the edge like this. That's the shot they were missing from this one moment. And, uh, and, and now the whole crew is down on the, on the ground. I, I can't, and I'm like this, I can't see or hear anybody. So a megaphone, action, and cut! That's all I could hear. All right, got it. So, uh, so when that was done, it was done, and I, and I was sent home. I thought, well, that, well that's the end of that day. You know, and it was a, it was a quick gig, easy. Uh, but what, it, what I didn't know what happened earlier that day, they had, some, they had somebody in the night before that they tried to cast from an extras agency, a background agency. Uh, to do the exact same shot. Because they were trying to save money, so they were just like, well, let's just get a background back and we'll you know, pay him 50 bucks and we'll you know, get him out of here, right? Well, <laughs> Guillermo's very specific uh, as a director and a storyteller. So that movement, you know, at the top, the, the, that image on the top of the building, he wanted the whole thing to move from the ankles, like this, right? And so he directed this person to do that, and, the, and, and, and he did this from the waist. Right? No, 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 not from the waist, from the ankles. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this happened again and again. So they're kind of like, okay, I think we got it. And send them home. And the next night I came in to try to fix this. <laughs> so it's something as simple as this. And he's like, yes! <laughs> so, so then, so then uh, I came back the next day. And uh, uh, it was, we were doing an, indoor, an interior shot on the green screen stage, a close up shot of some sort. Very simple, very small skeleton crew. And at lunchtime that day, Guillermo sat across the table from me. Um, and he put his tray down and said, uh, head, chin in hands, and said, So tell me everything you've been in before. <laughs> so I'm like, Wow, okay, so I'm going to start telling him my entire resume. Wow. Uh, and I didn't really, did and so he did, was not, um, I didn't know who he was because it was his first American film. Um, he, uh, uh, and it was a big budget film uh, with 20th Century Fox, and uh, so he had a big reputation in Mexico. He did a lot of television and film down there. He offered his first feature film was Chronos in Spanish language, but this was his first, you know, time. So I didn't. It, it was okay that I didn't know who he was. That no one did uh, in, in America often, right? not much. So, so it was uh, 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 an exchange. Unlike anything I'd had with the director before, you know, where, where he's getting all excited about creepy crawling monsters and wanted to hear about all the ones I've played, <laughs> and he knew every makeup artist I'd ever worked with before, and when I told him about Hocus Pocus, he said, oh, Tony Gardner did that makeup, is he a nice guy? Said, yeah, yeah, yes, he is, and oh my god, look at that, guy. So by the end of that lunchtime, he gave me his card and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I gave him my, he asked him for my card, and I gave it to him. Uh, so he, it was a drawing of me that I'd done myself, like, a, a, like this. <laughs> a cartoon drawing myself with that, uh, my phone number kind of floating outside my mouth. And he goes, oh, that's great. And he put it in his wallet. And then, uh, uh, but then, then another night, I, that, I was only scheduled for those two days, and then uh, another few days passed, and um, I got another desperate call from the producer of Mimic, saying, ah, they tried to save money one more time uh, and get a background guy, because I, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't expensive, but I wasn't cheap. Uh, back then, and uh, so they tried to get another background actor to come in to do a uh, scene outdoors at night in an alley, walking on a treadmill. Yeah, I don't know why, it was just walking on a treadmill, yeah, uh, with a brick building. And it, there was a couple shots they had to get done. One was walking up to a pillar and kind of looking around it, and another one was just walking on a treadmill with a green screen behind it, but the night, the night sky was with the lighting that they needed. Well, they, the call that I got was, was on, the, on the same day. Um, can you get down here right away, <laughs> as fast as possible? Uh, we gotta get rid of somebody and get you in. But oh, oh gosh, I don't, wanna, I don't know what I'm walking into here. But they hired a background guy to walk on the treadmill uh, in front of the screen screen as the, as the, as the bug man. And um, so they thought, again, how hard is it to walk on a treadmill? <laughs> 
Well, apparently, <laughs> uh, uh, this guy wasn't getting it. And so when I get in, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know the whole backstory. So I get in there, and I get into uh, the whole makeup thing. They uh, get me into the thing, and then another guy's been released for the night. He's gone. I came out on the set, and the first assistant director from Garrett was like, oh, I'm done. welcome back. I'm done. Okay. Okay, and then, uh, so uh, the first AD, the first assistant director was like, okay, now this, uh, Treadmill. Have you walked on a treadmill before? I'm like, well, yeah. I said, who can't walk on a treadmill? He goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I get on the treadmill. They turn it on. I start walking. Right? The film's rolling. And cut. Guillermo goes, thank you, God! <laughs> I didn't realize it was a religious experience we were having. <laughs> But apparently that other person could not walk on a treadmill. I, I can't, I can't, they're at every gym. You know what I'm saying, how hard is this? Anyway, so, uh, so, so Guillermo del Toro refers to that as the night I saved his ass, right? So, so he remembers things like that. And then five years later is when uh, they, were, they were doing the first uh, Hellboy uh, movie. And uh, I got another random phone call in the afternoon, or in one evening. Uh, hey, Doug, it's your friend Steve Wang. Steve Wang created my, my Tooth Fairy uh, creature character look for uh, Darkness Falls, which was later re replaced by another character, CD. Long story, painful story. Anyway, but, uh, but Steve Wang uh, uh, designed such a gorgeous creature. I mean, we worked together in Australia for like three months. Hey, Doug, it's your friend Steve Wang. Uh, uh, I got a director here who says he knows you, and um, uh, you know we're working on a new character for a movie. Would you want to come in tomorrow and meet with us and see about doing it? Yes, I would love this, right? So uh, uh, again, out of work actor getting a phone call like that is a good thing, you know. So uh, uh, what had happened earlier that day that led to this phone call was um, uh, they were had done a sculpture maquette uh, of a character. And they were going to have the director come in and look at this character uh, for the first time for his approval. And the movie was Hellboy. The character was Abe Sapien. The sculptor had done a, a 3D uh, maquette uh, sample of, what the, of the design. And the director, of course, was Guillermo del Toro. So he comes, <laughs> so legend has it that he comes walking into the room and they unveil this for him. You know, to look at Abe Sapien, and, and uh, legend has it, and it's been confirmed that he fell to his knees. <laughs> he said, "Oh, you are so beautiful, <laughs> and I am so fat." <laughs> <laughs> he said that. I'm not sure why. Probably because it was a long, lithe, beautiful, skinny creature, maybe, and that was his way of saying so. I don't know. I don't know, but that's when the, uh, the, the phone call, the phone came out, like, you know who should play this is Doug Jones, because all the creature guys in the room have worked with me before. Uh, Mike Elizalde owned the shop, and Jose Fernandez had done the sculpting, and, and Steve Wayne did the design work. So, uh, so they, the phone comes out, they call me, and Guillermo del Toro says, Doug Jones, wait, Doug Jones. I, I know Doug Jones, and he pulled that card out of his wall that I gave him five years earlier. <laughs> so that's how Hellboy 1 happened, and that's what really cemented our relationship as director. Uh, we understood each other, developed a short hand, and, um, and a great, great working relationship uh, that led into Pan's Labyrinth came next for us, uh, which was another glorious ride with two characters, the Fawn and the Pale Man. Uh, and, uh, and then from that, we did Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, where I reprised Dave Sapien, and then he tells me, uh, I want you to play two other characters too. Oh gosh, what? <sighs> Because uh, uh, Abe Sapien was in much more of the second movie, and I went only going to have time to work in two other characters. So um, he, uh, he said, Well, uh, one of them I wrote just for you, and the other one he, I didn't know who else I was going to get. So, <laughs> okay, and the cheap ass two characters were quite the one. You know, and, uh, so, anyway, so that's why I did. I also played the Angel of Death and the Chamberlain character. You saw those in, the, in that whole demo reel at the start of the day. So that, uh, that again was six months of, of, of pure pure bliss and pure hell all at the same time, you know, because of all that we went through. And um, and then uh, after that we came. Um, golly, uh, I did I, the Strain and Crimson Peak were kind of uh, his TV series, The Strain. I did six episodes as the uh, leader of the Ancient Vampires, mm -hmm. and um, also the original Master in one scene where I infected the new Master. And uh, in Crimson Peak, I 
was two of the ghost ladies in that. And it was during Crimson Peak uh, in January 2014 that he calls me into his office one day on a day off uh, at, uh, at lunchtime one day. Can you come into the U.S. office? He wants to talk to you. I'm like, what, am I in trouble? Is that you're being sent to the principal's office? So uh, I, get, I get to his office at the production, at the, the studio lot. Doesn't come in, shut the door. Oh, I am in trouble. So uh, he said, sit down. I'm, and he started telling me about this new movie he wanted to make after it was done with Crimson Peak. That he wanted to go smaller scale again and uh, something like a Pan's Labyrinth, but totally new story. I was like, yes, yes, he's been needing to do an artistic, from his heart, independent sort of story um, since Pan's Labyrinth. And he hadn't done one since then. You know, but, but he'd done Pacific Rim, he'd done and Crimson Peak, and he worked on, uh, on prepping other movies that hadn't been made. Uh, but it was time. So, um, so uh, uh, that's when he starts telling me about the shape of water. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, he said, I said, I'm not a bit worried about, about this because I know you're a good Catholic boy. <laughs> like, well, way, where are we headed with this? Right? <laughs> <laughs> how, how bad could it be? He goes, well, there's a sex scene. Oh. oh. <laughs> that's what I said. <laughs> So, <laughs> I said, how about we start at the beginning of the story and get into the bathroom? <laughs> so he told me the whole story as it was unfolding. I'm sitting there, like, thinking, this is this is such an epic tale, and ah, there's 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 mystery, there's there's you know sort of a supernatural mystic uh, intrigue, there's um, a, a, like a Russian Cold War, a U.S. Uh, time in history going on as well. Um, he got your lead lady who's, a, uh, who's mute, um, and, uh, and, and she's connecting with a fish man who's been caught in the Amazon. And this is just like, what a fantastical story this is, but in his care, I knew that this was going to be a, a beautifully told tale. So I'm just like, yes, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, this sounds delicious. So, uh, and, and, and the, the love scenes were very innocent, it wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't these, there was no sex scene. It was, there, there, was, there, was, there was intimate love happening there. And it was um, a very, uh, yeah, unlike anything I've ever played before. I've done, lo I've done lots of rubber bits, lots of monsters. Never, never been one that fell in love, you know, and stayed that way. <laughs> so, uh, so the shape of water was, uh, was quite, quite a fun ride. And so we've been through a lot together. Seven projects in 20 some years. You know. So I think, I think I'm going to have to actually hold off and uh, questions because Doug is going to be doing some signing uh, here pretty soon. And so let's give Doug a good hand, please.